I'm Josh Liston from On The Bubble Podcast, an oral history of television fandom, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to episode 250 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we celebrate 250 episodes by discussing how podcasting has changed since we started this show. In this week's Better Podcasting Download, we talk about owning an open source piece of podcasting legendary software. And finally, in this week's Better Podback, we have a listener who is curious, but our names aren't George. Lauren, start the show now. Welcome to Better Podcasting. With a combined history of over a thousand episodes and starting as early as 2008, we are hobby podcasters through and through, just like you. That's why we are different. We minimize the money talk so that you can focus on building a better podcast. Here are the hosts for the show, Stephen John Drew and Stargate Pioneer. Welcome to the 250th episode of Better Podcasting, at least officially named. I am Steven, and with me, of course, is SP. I know these episodes are timeless, but I remember when we made the decision to start Better Podcasting, it was really cold out, mm -hmm. and now it's May, and it's a lot warmer. I mean, I'm in a golf shirt versus, like, bundled up in sweats and sweatshirts and stuff like that, so I like this podversary of 250 episodes. I think it's great. It's a great time to be celebrating 250 episodes. And I want to thank our listeners right off the top because you guys downloading, you guys interacting with us all through the years here since 2015 when we started. You're the reason why we're still here. We're the reason why we're doing this. It's for you and we appreciate you. Yes, we do. Thank you for all of your support over the blast. The blast, the last 250 episodes, it has been a blast, is what I was it trying has. to say. And uh, yeah, we hope to do some more. So keep your eyes on the future of Better Podcasting and come to our Discord at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord, because we like to chat with our listeners in between the shows as well. Now, we're not going to have any crazy shenanigans here today. It's not going to be a big, long clip show or anything, but... We do have a fun episode that we are going to talk a little bit about things that have changed. But before we get there, I want to give a little shout out here. I want to say thank you to our new guest host that we had last week, yes. Robot Voice SP. Appreciate Robot Voice SP coming in, spending a little time, short notice. Thank you very much to Robot SP. In truth, Robot SP or Robo SP, that was awesome. Uh, Steven. For those that don't know, reached out, reached forward, was able to take care of business. I wasn't able to be here two weeks ago when we were supposed to record. So he did a special little show and he included me into it. It's just it, it wasn't my voice. But now I feel vindicated. I feel like I have taught my Padawan enough that he has actually created a co-host so that when I retire, he has somebody to co-host with. So I loved it. I liked it. Thank you very much for all the support, by the way, in the last couple of weeks. For those that don't know, I went through a little uh, family emergency, but we were able to get a show to you anyway. And it was an abbreviated show. I had absolutely nothing to do with it other than tell Stephen to give him carte blanche to have fun. And he did. He had fun and he had me laughing when I was watching and listening to the results. So thank you very much, Stephen. I, I want to say thank you. I want to redirect those thanks to the listeners and the viewers for uh, our delay. Thank you very much. And more importantly, thank you for understanding and supporting SP uh, as he went through that. So I will take those thanks and redirect them to the, the listeners and the viewers. Five and a half years and 249 episodes ago, the podcasting space was a different place when we started Better Podcasting. There was no Roadcaster Pro. That came out in December 2018, and we started in October 2015. Anchor hadn't launched yet. That was February of 2016. 
The Samsung Q2U wasn't a thing yet. Uh, the podcasting pack was first available on Amazon on April 13th, 2016. Uh, the podcast audiogram wasn't a huge deal yet. The first reference I could find in all of our notes and all the news was in 2016. And get this, Stephen, I love this. Google Play Music for podcasts was still months away and Google Podcasts itself was years away. It didn't come out until 2018. In short, things have changed in the past 66 months or so for podcasters. And here at Better Podcasting, we've had a front row seat to watch as evolutions were made in podcasting. Not all the changes have been beneficial or relevant for hobby podcasters, so we've been selective as to what we cover for you here. We haven't covered everything, but even narrowing down the changes, focusing on the changes that do affect hobby podcasters, uh, there's basically a Canadian moose ton of changes that have occurred since we started Better Podcasting. So today, as we celebrate the 250th episode of Better Podcasting, we'll run down some notable changes in the podcasting space since we started this show and what they mean for you as a hobby podcaster. Let's start it all off talking about popular music in podcasts. If there was one piece of production advice about creating a show in late 2015 that we would give hobby podcasters, it was to stay away from radio songs in your podcast. In 2015, it was a surefire way to owe the man a lot of money that you couldn't afford. From music podcasts to just wanting a notable intro, everyone wanted to play that song in your podcast. It's May 2021 now, and, well, generally speaking, you still can't do that. You're not going and putting that ACDC or, or Rolling Stones track in your podcast. Well, not affordably anyway, but you can launch a limited show to be distributed on Spotify via their anchor podcast media hosting company using the library of songs that is available through that. As stated before, this show might not technically be a podcast if you're going to do that, but it is a way to distribute a show using some form of popular music, even though there are plenty of restrictions on what you play and how much of a song you will play. We're not sure if hobby podcasters in general will ever be able to legally play popular songs in their podcasts at affordable prices, but we do think that this portion of the industry will continue to evolve. So be on the watch for future development because what Anchor is doing right now is something that back in 2015, I think people would have said would never have happened. It was definitely a high hurdle to get over. Another thing that we witnessed the evolution of was recording multiple USB microphones. Stephen, remember back in the day when you actually had to buy two Blue Yetis and you had to send one back so that it could be reversed on, on uh, the frequency or whatever it was so that it could come in as a different microphone? You remember those days? No, I completely blocked Blue Yeti from all of my mind. Okay, well, that's good because we don't advocate doing a Blue Yeti, but I remember that was a thing back in the day. Now, recording multiple USB microphones into one computer has always been a struggle, still kind of is, but there was no such thing as a USB mixer or a dedicated USB recording device. And the technicalities of routing multiple audio from multiple USB devices in operating systems like Mac OS and Windows wasn't always plug and play. Sure, you had programs like Voice Meter and Audio Hijack, but you often heard or read of reports of issues using those with multiple USB microphones. And for this one, we're going to be sliding cheating on the whole thing because Spreaker Studio launched in the fall of 2015 and was technically capable of doing this. But <laughs> common programs to enable recording multiple USB microphones didn't widely exist while we started better podcasting. Now, programs that record multiple USB microphones are more commonplace. In addition to those services, what we just talked about, the Rode recently started their own service, and online recording services like CleanFeed are now offering ways to perform this task through their services. There's a few other workarounds as well, right, Stephen? Yeah, like I think there's more commonplace hardware that people can use 
in order to get some USB uh, microphones into things like tablets and other devices that they have at their fingertips, which again is kind of cheating a little bit, but you can potentially use that in with other uh, programs and communication services in order to still kind of achieve multiple USB sources in one recording. So th there continues to be more evolution to have multiple USB devices uh, recording one podcast. But will we ever at Pyatter Podcasting recommend recording with multiple USB microphones on the same PC? Never say never. Yeah, never say never. But in 2021, there are other ways to record multiple USB microphones that reduce the risk to the recording that are currently better than multiple USB recordings, but th there are ways to do it. And that is evolving. And we just didn't have those mainstay capabilities back in when 2015, when we recorded. Now, Steven, uh, let's see, evolve the discussion a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the industry. Yeah, because the changes in podcasting do go beyond the specifics that we've just acknowledged right now. There are just a few highlights we wanted to mention. We want to go a little bit more into some of the other areas in the industry that might have had a bigger impact on the day-to-day -day lives of hobby podcasters than you might first think when you think about the things that we're about to talk about. And let's begin with one of the biggest things in podcasting, which is a definition of what a podcast is. What is a podcast? Besides being a miserable pile of secrets, as there was once a convention panel that was hosted by the amazing SP, it goes more than that. Because in 2015, there was a sort of a standard definition of what a podcast was, whether you liked it or not. A podcast was an audio file, normally an MP3 file that was distributed to a listener through the use of an RSS feed. But in 2021, we want to say, and, and take the moment to think about that question, is this still technically the definition of what a podcast is? Because podcasts have become more mainstream in society. There are plenty of YouTubers who call their show a podcast. There are plenty of limited distribution shows through things like Luminary and Spotify and soon-to-be Apple Podcasts that are exclusive to their service, but still refer to the show as a podcast. And more importantly, the listeners see it as a podcast. So while the technical definition, or what was the technical definition of a podcast, may not likely change for the, the immediate future, what the public calls a podcast is probably going to be more encompassing and is already than where it was in 2015. Will the term podcast even remain in 10 to 20 years from now? A show probably will, but we don't know. Neither of us really know whether the term podcast will stand the test of time. But one of the biggest changes to the definition of the podcast are not what content creators are defining as a podcast. It is what consumers of the content are defining as a podcast. And getting back to some of those examples we mentioned earlier, the general public have started to define podcasts very differently than what podcasters defined a podcast as. And I think that this in itself is one of the biggest changes that we've seen with podcasting since 2015. Because when we started Better Podcasting, the odds were that the average person that you spoke to didn't know what a podcast was. We literally covered this topic along the way, explaining what a podcast was or how you can frame that to Joe or Jane Average. That's something we talked about in the show. In fact, for a while there, there were many podcast creators that were tracking occasions when they heard about podcasts in mainstream media or pop culture. This was a thing that podcasters like to do. If you're a longtime listener, you might even know that we once did an entire gag on Better Podcasting based off of Last Man Standing having chimes talking about their or to do with their podcast. I remember that when we did this, I actually felt really awkward watching Last Man Standing with my wife because I, I felt like they were almost placating to quote my type just because like I was a podcaster and, and, and I felt like the odd person out. But now looking back on it, it seems like a lifetime ago because podcasts are constantly being mentioned 
all through different pop culture and in day-to-day lives with others. And this is huge because one of the biggest obstacles that podcasters used to face is now gone. It's a lot less often that we have to spend time trying to get people interested in the idea of listening to a podcast because they already know what a podcast is and might even listen. And because of this whole mainstream familiarity with it, I think that is shifted the power of what is a podcast from the podcaster's definition to the general public. And now looking inwards into the podcast industry itself, let's talk a little bit about the podcast advice space within podcasting. While the education of what a podcast is has changed to the general public, there's also been a lot that has changed in the education for podcasters since 2015. A pop quiz, Stephen, why did we start better podcasting? Uh, Is this aside from the billions of dollars that we've made along the way? It would definitely be because unless you've been holding out on me, I haven't seen any of those royalties. (laughs) And quite honestly, it's not why we started better podcasting. Billions of Canadian dollars. And again, it's not why we started better (laughs) podcasting. If you listen to Better Podcasting for a while, you might know the answer to this. We originally created Better Podcasting because we felt that in the podcast advice space, there was not a lot of information that was tailored towards the hobby podcaster. At the time, we felt that there was a lot of podcast advice out there that was easily accessible, but it was all about the money or had arterial motives that were about growing podcast advice businesses. And while there still are a lot out there, the reality is that with the way the podcasting space has ballooned, there's a lot of easily accessible resources available for very specific areas that podcasters may want to do research on, whether it's on YouTube, Reddit, a podcast itself, like Better Podcasting or on a blog. There are a lot of resources available from people just like us who are hobbyists, just having fun podcasting and wanting to share the tips and tricks of their passion. We think that the available resources for hobby podcasters has grown so much that the scales have significantly shifted when it comes to whether or not there is any value in hobby podcasters hiring somebody to give them podcast advice. Back when we started Better Podcasting, there were a lot of technical hurdles that had to be overcome. And for many people that weren't techies, they had to learn all this tech behind the podcast. And paying for a crash course from somebody could have offered some value. However, things have changed. The technical bar is much lower because of the services provided to podcasters these days. So when you look at all of the free resources out there, there are very few situations where we think a hobbyist would get much value out of paying for podcast advice, especially when you start out. The next thing that we want to talk about is starting a podcast, because one of the reasons there are so many resources available for hobby podcasters now is because it has become so easy for hobby podcasts to happen and thus create the resources. If you look back at the early days of podcasting, you could pretty clearly define the cost of starting a podcast. This is something that early on in podcasting, it was very easy to define that because there weren't a lot of options. You move forward a little bit to when we started Better Podcasting, it was really two options. You go with a USB microphone or a hardware recorder. That's where we started Better Podcasting. And often when you were connecting with people remotely, you were stuck using the ladder while bridging through something like Skype or a crazy computer that can handle a bunch of different connections. But now things have changed so much. There are a variety of options in between these two options, which makes it a lot easier to podcast. There are many services available that allow people to communicate with their co-hosts and record all in one. However, making podcast creation easier goes well beyond just connecting and recording with your co-hosts. It goes through the whole production process, including the critical part of hosting your podcast files. One step that used to take a lot of time was getting all of your metadata together for your podcast. When we started Better Podcasting, this was something that we covered. How do you get that metadata into your podcast? This was for both ID3 tags and maybe, this is loosely using the term metadata, 
in the, in the information into your RSS feed. However, things have changed a lot. And in many cases, if you're using a media host provider, these two things can actually be done all in one. This is just one example on how it has made things easier and reduces the amount of steps that are needed to start a podcast. But going to a more superficial level of media hosting, back when we started podcasting, there were really just a few reliable media hosts. And then pretty much everything else was taking a gamble, right, SP? In some way, shape, manner, or form, yeah. You never knew if they were going to last or if they were reliable, meaning their uptime was reliable, or whether they would sustain themselves with funding. And although denial may have made some people think otherwise, the reality is that anytime a new podcast media host popped up, there was always a really good chance that they would disappear with little notice within a few years. For a while, it seemed like we were constantly saying goodbye to podcast media hosting companies. And while there are still some of these situations that do happen, it seems like the regular cycle of, quote, a new media host appears, slash, new media host disappears, unquote, has mostly gone away. And emerging now are some players that seem to be around for the long-term game. Even if some of them are still working to find their long-term target audience and pricing structure or how they would fit into the podcasting infrastructure today. But all of these media hosts coming and going weren't for naught. Although many of them may be gone now, the reality is that many of these people who created these came to the industry with new ideas, new opinions, and a fresh take on what a media host could be. Multiple players in podcast media hosts were forced to take a look at what these new offerings were coming into the space with and realized that they had to adapt if they wanted to keep their position in the industry. They couldn't have their closed minded vision of what a media host could be, and they couldn't keep catering towards the nerdy techie podcaster. They needed to be more accessible to an average Jane or an average Joe podcaster. And some of them found out the hard way of what happens when you don't do this along the way. Which takes us to our next point. The industry influencers have changed drastically. Let's just cut to the chase. Spotify. That's who we were just referring to a minute ago. Spotify buying Anchor. Although we have never gotten on board fully with the Anchor train on better podcasting (laughs) for a variety of reasons that we still stand behind, we do credit Anchor for taking a fresh approach to podcast media host and creation. And despite some of the stumbles that they had along the way, they came up with some pretty original ideas when it came to the tools that a hosting provider could provide hobby podcasters. Well, podcasters in general, but we focus on hobby podcasters. They really broke the mold when it came to what a podcast media host could be, and it paid off for them, specifically when Spotify paid that massive amount of money to buy Anchor. When this happened, many podcasters, podcast companies, and shall we even say podcast pundits, couldn't really understand this purchase. It didn't matter because Spotify, in the end, spent the money to buy Anchor. Clearly, they saw something that they wanted with Anchor, and given that they probably passed on many other further established media hosts when they were shopping around, because you know they did their research, some of which had pretty large podcasts on them, it really gave reason to believe that Spotify might have been interested more in the specific unique qualities that Anchor was offering at the time. Almost immediately after this deal was announced, the podcast industry had a very strong odor. That was the odor of sour grapes. Yes, you heard many in the media host industry throw shade at the deal, but in the end, it didn't matter. We observed the same thing happened with all of them. They all started to come up with their own unique ideas after this acquisition. Really come to the realization that they needed to do a little bit more. And while it's unlikely that we'll be seeing another acquisition of a media host in the price tag that Anchor got anytime soon, these changes have helped shake up who the key influencers are in the podcast space. This is an example on how the industry influencers have changed. You have big companies like Spotify throwing their weight around to help influence what is happening with the industry. 
Some of the big names and big companies that were in the podcasting space when we started Better Podcasting no longer have the stronghold they used to have when it comes to influencing the podcast space. There are several companies out there that when we started the show, you could easily see their opinion and that opinion have a shift on decisions being made by other big players in the industry. But in this particular case, it isn't the case. And many of these big players are tiny compared to the modern definition of a big player in the podcasting space. You're talking about a couple of million or tens of millions of dollars versus hundreds of millions of dollars to a billion dollars. This means that to get a pulse on the industry, you no longer have just a couple of resources to look at. You need to look at a variety of different places and companies and see what they are doing to try to influence the future direction of the industry. And as we discussed last week, this has even had an influence on Apple. While Apple's changes have often seemed to be pretty original, their most recent changes seemed a little bit of a catch up, trying to align themselves with some of the other players in the industry. And as a side note, this is the exact reason why we're covering industry stuff within Better Podcasting. We have since episode two with the Better Podcasting download to take a look at the podcasting industry and what it really means to hobby podcasters. And there is more influencers on the scene. You got Pandora, which started to, into the podcasting space in November of 2015, and they acquired Serial. Shortly thereafter, they had more podcasts that entered into the space. And you have a bunch of other industry companies that came into the space since we started Better Podcasting that really have a say on what goes on just because of the whole, they had the iHeartMedia Awards, right? The podcast awards, we scoff at it all the time because they say they're the only ones, but they have been touting podcast awards on open radio, thus legitimatizing. Okay, I can't say that. I'm from Minnesota. Give me a break here. The podcast industry. Now, let's jump back a minute or two. We talked briefly about the most recent changes in Apple, but we want to come back to them because quite honestly, we think that Apple deserves an entire section to talk about their changes since they've been a, such a big part of the industry for so long. Right, Stephen? Yeah. Back when we started Better Podcasting, submission to Apple Podcasts was a very manual process. It was basically just a form. That's what it was. There was also limited official information on what the review process and expectations were when you, as a hobby podcast, were submitting your podcast to Apple Podcasts. You didn't really know how long it would take to get approved or rejected from Apple Podcasts. Sometimes you could get rejected for content reasons. Sometimes you could get rejected for something technically basic that you did wrong. In either case, you didn't really know until you went through the whole review process. You could increase your odds of approval by using outside resources. There were tools that we had recommended, such as putting your RSS feed through to see if it was validated. These would help identify basic formatting issues, recommended changes to your artwork size, etc. But it was still waiting on Apple. Now things have changed, though. The good news is Apple Podcasts has significantly changed since then. Apple Podcasts now has an actual interactive system. When you enter your RSS feed, it does all that checking for you. It does a brief validation to check your RSS feed and advise you of errors. This gives you a chance to fix it before you wait for that submission to be reviewed. Additionally, you have a lot more communication coming out of Apple. And this is one of the greatest things. I know through the 250 episodes of Better Podcasting, I have often, often griped about different things with Apple. But I will say that to their credit, I am so happy that Apple does regularly communicate now about some of the changes that they've made. Even if they are arbitrary, at least they are communicating them to people. Back when we started, it was very rare to get updates from, from Apple. And this meant that at large, the community actually had to provide the updates. SP, do you remember when you would hear people saying, well, you know what? It's going to be December now when traditionally Apple doesn't have as many people reviewing podcasts. So you might want to wait a little bit to see uh, a little longer to get your podcast approved. 
Now Apple comes out and they go, we're going to have reduced hours on these weeks. So I love the communication out of Apple now compared to where it was when we started better podcasting because they are still a big part of podcasting. And so it's great that they do have these communications more regularly. And to their credit, they are adapting to the changing podcast infrastructure and space. Uh, yeah, they they still want to be a lead element in all of that, but they are recognizing that in order to do that, they have to lean forward and be proactive in the podcast space, and not just sit back anymore. And there's a lot of money in podcasting these days or a lot more than there used to be. So Apple wants to try to get their hands on some of that. Now, moving on, of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't dedicate an entire section to listener habit changes. Earlier, we discussed a bit about how listeners have changed, but we thought we needed to expand further on how listener habits have changed in podcasting. Back when we started Better Podcasting, most people were listening largely in one of two places, either on their computer or on their smartphone slash MP3 player. But this has now changed so much. Now you have smart speakers, you have built-in playback to vehicles, you even have playback built into social media and other dynamic content platforms. This means that for an average hobbyist, the environment for podcast listeners is dynamic. Some are listening on high-end speakers. Others are listening using the speaker on their phone. You have headphones and speaker quality, which have drastically improved for the average consumer. This means that the audio quality is potentially much more important than it used to be while you're producing your show. When we started Better Podcasting, it was easy to say that most of your audience wouldn't notice the subtle issues in your audio because of their likely noisy listening environments and their poor speakers that they were listening on. But now you can't bank on this as there is probably a good portion of your listeners who are listening on better quality speakers than you have would have had just a few years ago. A supporting example of this change is how the acceptable bit rate has changed for a podcast. When we started, it was pretty clear. Most people were saying that 64 kilobits per second was the constant recommendation, even though we both kind of disagreed with it. But now 64 kilobits per second is much lower than the going rate, which is now around 96 kilobits per second. And it continues to balloon from there. In fact, there are many services such as the Amazon integration, which suggests higher quality than that. This is important to keep your eyes on because as we record this in May 2021, you are seeing some pretty strong players shift away from the norms of podcast distribution. And we think there's a good chance they'll start to dictate technical specs that they want to be on their platform. And that could be a certain audio quality. If you don't have that certain audio quality, which they maintain as a standard, you might stick out like a sore thumb or they might not even play your stuff too. I mean, we haven't seen that yet, but it's possible. However, listener habit changes go beyond this. Listener regularity has changed quite a bit. Back when we started Better Podcasting, it seemed like daily podcast listeners were a special breed, largely podcasters themselves. However, now it's not uncommon for an average Jane or an average Joe to mostly listen to podcasts. Stephen, you've recently had a conversation around the, quote, water cooler at work. I hope it's virtual for you about this very subject. Yeah, uh, we had a conversation at work that was people talking about what's the hobby that they do outside of work. And I had a colleague who said they're a podcast junkie. And this is just an average colleague that just, uh, you know, you, a- average person. And, and that's what they called themselves. Was a, that, that is their hobby. Hobby is podcast consumption. They listed off a bunch of different shows that they listen to and then um, how much they listen to them, which was multiple per day. And I just thought that was a great example of just an average Joe or average Jane being a podcast junkie listening more than one episode every day. Yeah, my coworkers don't necessarily know that I do better podcasting, but we do have a conversation at least once a week, if not twice a week, about the different podcasts that everybody is listening to and what the value of that information is to us in the workplace specifically. So we talk about the research has, that has been done, the news items that had been talked about, just the different podcast series that are out there. If you're trying to get yourself up on a certain 
issue, whether it's political or technical or whatever. And that is huge because it was just in the last couple of years. I remember just three years ago, we had somebody that left the office three years ago. And I remember talking to her before she left about podcasts. She had a long drive into work. And, and near the end of her time with us, she actually left to get a job closer to her home. She was talking about listening to podcasts instead of the radio or music. And it was kind of an odd duck in the office. I supported her, of course, but nobody else was really talking about it. Fast forward a couple of years and just two months ago, we were talking before a guy left on paternity leave. We were talking about all the podcasts that he should stack up and listen to while he's been on leave. And he has signed into us on our work chat and told us where he is and what he's getting out of it and what it means to the office. So yeah, this sort of stuff never used to happen. And it's now happening now. It's amazing how far listener consumption habits have changed when it comes to the frequency of listening to podcasts, not to mention the content of the podcasts themselves as well. With all of that said, why does any of this matter? Well, first, it was our 250th episode, and we wanted to talk about the changes that we've seen for hobby podcasters since we started Better Podcasting back in 2015. However, it goes further than that. As we said earlier in the show, and many times in the past 250 episodes, we always say that we try to prioritize being a voice for hobby podcasters. We try to stay informed about the latest happenings in the world of podcasting and try to filter through it to help you here are the things that we think are key takeaways for hobby podcasters. But as today's episode has demonstrated, the industry of podcasting itself has changed so fast and continues to change fast. And this means that we can't cover everything. We think as a hobby podcaster, it's important that you try to keep up to date with some of the key changes in the podcast industry as they happen. We think that this is huge for you as a hobby podcaster. When you hear about these things, you should try to get the information that you need to figure out what is important to apply to your own show. It's important that you try to make the best educated guess on what you think is applicable to your podcast and take actions based on that. Every podcaster's specific needs are different. And in such a rapidly changing industry, it's unlikely that any podcast advice giver will cover your exact needs 100% of the time. That's why you need to make your own decisions based on your own needs of your show. However, we also hope that today's show shows some of the different experimental phases that are behind us. For example, the balloon of media hosts seems to be largely gone. And as we record this in 2021, we believe the industry is still in a big shift as far as movement towards big money goes in the infrastructure space. We also think that to a degree, things have shaken out in some of the smaller areas that are key for hobby podcasters, such as live streaming services. As hobbyists, we're in a unique space right now. While we have to keep an eye out for these big changes coming, the big money part of podcasting, we also get to continue to experiment with new things as they come along with a relatively low risk bar since we aren't depending on our podcast for money. And that right there is one of the things that has kept both of us going and doing better podcasting over the last 250 episodes. Trying out some of the new things in the podcast space, sharing some of our successes and our failures with all of you. I'd love to know what's the standout moment That is something that has either come into the industry or changed or went away from the last 250 episodes that we've done better podcasting. What what is that thing? And uh, I'm going to say right now, don't say blab, okay? Don't say blab. We rib on blab enough. What is the other thing from blab that stands out to you, listeners and viewers? Get in touch with us through any of the ways. You can tweet us at betterpod. You can email podcast at betterpodcasting.com which as a friendly reminder, we have a video companion. So why don't you send us a video clip? You can also come to betterpodcasting.com slash discord. Or if you feel like it, I would encourage you to enlist text to speech SP to send a carrier pigeon to SP with your audio message. No, whatever works. (laughs) 
<laughs> Let's go ahead and move on to the Better Podcasting Download. This is the Better Podcasting Download. The main item that we wanted to cover today is a little bit of news that came out, I don't know, about a week and two weeks ago. Audacity was acquired and incorporated into a new incorporated group called the Muse Group. Now, I know what you're saying. SP, isn't Audacity open source software? And you'd be right, it is. But there still is things about it that are business related. For instance, the trademark is owned by somebody. So Muse Group went ahead and they incorporated it into what they've got going on. And since Audacity is used by so many people because it's free, it's versatile. There are a lot of tutorials out there. It's constantly evolving even today. And most hobbyists have at least heard of Audacity if you haven't flat out used it for your show. That we wanted to cover this and what it may or may not mean to you as a hobbyist. First of all, it is open source software. So that means that no one individual can really own it. And the best equation I can give to this, if you're a video streamer or podcaster whatsoever, you may have at least heard of OBS and OBS Studio. That is a open broadcast software, right? OBS. There are different versions of OBS out there based on the source code. So our friend and co-host over on the Guinea Geek Show has used a special version of OBS called OBS Streamlabs. It was just a a special coded version of it. And and that's a good example of what can be done here. So eventually, are we going to see different versions of Audacity out there? It's possible, but I I think it's going to be so ubiquitous that it's just going to be one main thing because if it branches out into other versions I just don't see it as being useful for everybody as it is right now. Steven, what do you think about this whole acquisition thing? Yeah, I think what as a hobbyist, if I was using Audacity, I would just be on the lookout to see what the community is behind, because um, I I think it is worth noting that there's all sorts of licensing and things when it comes to open source and whatnot. And from what what I believe um, I've read with with Audacity is that it is the distribution where people can build on it and um, have the ability to do their own forks and whatnot. And and a fork is basically when someone takes a piece of code and they make their own version of it, like SP just used with the uh, OBS example. If all of a sudden we see that whoever owns the Muse Group owns this trademark or whatever, whatever it is that they've bought, and and they start to take it in a way that is weird, that just doesn't set right with podcasters. For whatever reason, I could see the community that centers around Audacity going, okay, well, we'll go to the previous uh, version and fork it out to our own thing. And that is more like the way that we've always loved with Audacity. So I, I don't really understand fully with the whole open source concept. And I'm sure that people are yelling right now saying, you guys are idiots. This is the big problem. Or, or, or you guys are idiots. This is why it's not news. But I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a coder. I'm not somebody that really needs to know a lot about the open source stuff. So I I know that there are differences between different ways that things are provided um, in Creative Commons and open source software and whatnot. But I just think that that would be what I would watch is because even if this group is just going to take the name and rename it, that actually in itself could not be enough to motivate coders and developers because developers like things their own way to make their own fork that is actually what we now refer to as Audacity. So I don't know. I'm interested to see what happens with this. In any case, you know Audacity is covered by enough podcasters that if there is a change, there will be a clear winner. (laughs) And even if Audacity starts to be degraded to the point where it's not really usable for podcasters, there's so many other programs out there right now that are really affordable or freeware that you can use those instead of Audacity. Everybody's talking about Audacity because it's been there since day one, but there are other programs out there right now. Re- Reaper, there, there's one. Yes, there you 
a trial license that you could take, but the cost of Reaper is really low. And you can use one of those additional pieces of software and get to know it really easily. The lots of tutorials out there. Uh, so I, I almost think this is non-news. I almost think it's non-news, but there's just so many podcasters that are using it and it's been hyped for so many free podcasters or hobby podcasters out there that we wanted to at least mention it on this show. There's one other thing I just wanted to quickly touch on was that came across our desks that there's this thing called cleanvoice.ai that removes all of your ahs from your recording. Apparently it's $3 once, $10, five times, $15, 10 uses. Is that per ah? Uh? <laughs> no, it's per your file that you throw in oh. there. Oh, Yeah, don't, don't say ah, uh, and then it'll remove it. <laughs> yeah, so I haven't used this personally, but it is an interesting trial, especially if you're just starting to podcast and you might not have your vocal tempo down or you might not have your hosting skills down to the point where you use verbal crutches and uh is a horrendous verbal crutch that most american podcasters use and when i'm listening to a podcast i don't want to hear all that so if you need to remove those and you don't want to sit there and remove every single one as you're listening one for one through your podcast as it goes all the way through you can use this uh, cleanvoice.ia and see if it works for you. It could get expensive over time, though. There are a contact information for a site license, but I think at the amount that most hobbyists would use this, I think you'd want to stick to uh, the, the limited license of using it just a few times and just see where it goes from there. And if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, then there are other ways to do it, like removing them yourself or using one of the transcription audio editing services that I have yet to do, <laughs> but I've heard a lot of people have used it and have used it effectively. So it really just depends on what you want to do there. I should check this out sometime because I've noticed on Better Podcasting live chat, I have started to use uh, a ton over there, but it's live and we bill that as such. I'm not going to remove it from there, but I think it would be a good thing to test and hear how it sounds in the end. Just because I, I have that question mark with any of these automated services, how does it stitch it together? But we'll find out. Maybe we should do a test. Or the listeners will write us and say, I tried it. This was my experience. So if you tried it, please let us know. The one issue that I know just by removing a lot of ums myself is if the vocal ca cadence changes yeah. from before the um to after the um, you either have to leave space in there or in some cases, some limited cases, you just leave that um in there yeah. because it just makes sense. Be there's no way to take it out unless you stitch audio from somewhere else, which really removes the intent behind the podcast to begin with. So uh, if you uh, have uh, used that, let us know. <laughs> this is where we here at Better Podcasting turn the show over to you as we run through some of your feedback. We call this segment Better Podback. We got a few pieces of feedback this week that we wanted to touch on, and we will save the one we teased for last because I love it. Love it so much. I, I thought we were going to start with it. I was already scrolled to it. I was already hyped to talk about it. It's good. Let's start with Yakko or Yak Zero. Yeah, I'll, you say Yakko, I'll say Yak Zero. We'll cover both off. Yak Zero. Yakko. <laughs> so, Jeremy from the Transmission Podcast. Also, he was on the America's Best Podcaster show recently. He chimed in on our Discord server and he said, Oof, I noticed about seven minutes into our recording last night that my audio wasn't being picked up in audition. <gasps> it looks like Windows was doing something to my audio devices that I haven't had a chance to fully track down yet. Sound familiar, Stephen? Mm -hmm. I had to restart audition so it had the right device selected and hit record and had my H6 make a marker at the time so I can hopefully sync them up easily later. And he did say later on that that sync marker on the H6 actually worked for him. I have had too many times where I've had different tracks that I've had to line up and I don't have a consistent start point. 
what I what I almost always end up doing is um, using the end if I can to, to line them up because generally I'll stop them at the same time. But if that doesn't happen, like if they're two different sources, two different people stopping, I will look for excitement, <laughs> look at the waveform and be like, okay, this is a, a noticeable excited block that looks very distinct. Let me go look at that on the other track. That's usually what I'll do. But you got to then start scrolling and, oh, okay, press play. I hear them saying this word. So let me go find that word on this. And, and you kind of start going through. It's not fun. So I'm glad you had the marker. I am. I, I've done that before where I haven't been able to align tracks up as I'm doing my multi-track editing for Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. And I have ended up listening to 10 or 15 minutes of audio on both tracks The you know, the standard track that I'm trying to sync it up to and the track that I'm trying to bring in and finally getting to the point where I say, OK, here's where it is. And sometimes that happens when a co-host gives me the wrong track. <laughs> And I'm like, this does not seem like it would work. Usually an indicator is a different length, right? That's the the easy, yeah. oh, wow, this is way too short or this is way too long or something like that. But no, in, the, in this, this, some of the cases, it's like, uh, this is not the right show. And then I start hearing things that are familiar and it wasn't from that week. So then I'm like, oh, this is from a couple of weeks ago, which, by the way, I have to tell you right now, Stephen, since we're talking about this, you almost didn't get the correct sp track from last night's gonna geek show oh. it was a completely different track and i was about to upload it and i was like wait a minute that doesn't look right so i listened to it i'm like no that is not even the show that's another show so i don't know what happened i did select the correct track to bring in to uh audacity actually to then save as a flag file right I, I brought the right track in but audacity did not load the right track so i don't know what the heck happened last night but you did end up getting the right track so it happens even to us yeah i was gonna say confession time because i've actually done the same uh, uh thing that sp mentioned with the wrong track using his gonna geek show track in better podcasts thing i'll load it all up and then i'll be like <laughs> oh what uh, yeah he said this but Oh, wait, he's talking podcasting, not talking about the latest space news. Oh, that would be terrible if it happened to be <laughs> one of the very few shows that I talk podcasting on Gonna Geek. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I, I don't know where I am. Yeah. Talking about podcasting, Randy Walker in our Discord said, anybody know the process for transferring slash claiming an Apple podcast directory listing? I thought this was uh, pretty neat, and I didn't mention it in the regular show, but I'm still having problems getting into the new Apple Podcasts. I'm still in the iTunes Connect with both my accounts, so I haven't been able to get into the new Apple Podcasts. I'm hoping that by the end of May, as Apple Podcasts have said in their email, that everything's just going to transfer over. I'm hoping that's going to work at this point, but who knows? Stay tuned. Anyway... From the Apple email, I actually got an email from Apple, by the way, on both my account email addresses, so they know I exist now. I got it, and this is after a few years. I haven't received an email from Apple Podcasts in a while, but I did look at the email. And there was a couple of paragraphs in there that might help you out, Randy. One was, quote, if your shows have been submitted by multiple users, an account admin or the account owner will need to contact us to specify a single unified Apple ID to migrate the catalog to. If you manage shows across multiple site manager accounts, a unified Apple ID will need to be specified for each one. So basically, the moral of the story is contact us. Now, I have contacted them on both of my accounts. I haven't found resolution on that yet to transfer my accounts over from iTunes Connect to Apple Podcasts, but we'll see. So the second paragraph says, quote, if a unified Apple ID isn't specified, You'll be able to manage the show submitted by your Apple ID by logging into a pod, Apple Podcast Connect at the end of May, unquote. Now, I'm at this point where I'm just going to ride this out and I'm going to see what happens. However, it is a very risky move, especially if you're making money from your podcast. Like, I don't know if Randy is or not, but I'm like, I don't know. And Better Podcasting is one of the shows in Apple Podcasts that is on one of my accounts. Randy, I don't know what podcast that you are searching for, but it could be a risky move or it could be like, well, let's just see what happens and let's hope things just turn out. I, I don't know what to do here. It, a lot of people have had problems with Apple podcasts. 
I'm concerned about the part that says an account admin or the account owner will need to contact us in relation to the comment about being submitted by multiple users. What is that? Like, are they looking for the account admin, uh, like the one in your RSS feed? Are they looking for the first person that claimed it? Like, what is their definition of an account admin or the account owner? if you're talking about multiple users that submitted it, because theoretically, all those users have their own account and they're all admins of their own account. So I, I'm really confused about that phrase there. As am I. <laughs> Jason and Bryant said, I found that using Restream actually worked much better for me than StreamYard. I believe this was in relation to Restream, which is a service we've briefly talked about before. I actually use it every week, don't need to anymore, but, for, you know, old habits die hard. Uh, I use it every week when we're streaming live for this show and the Gunna Geek show. A, a while ago, they created something that was kind of like StreamYard, where people could connect in and and um, basically do all the video production within Restream, and uh, Jason was going to try that out, and I understand you got a little more information about that, didn't you? I did. I was wondering if he was using an external video uh, combiner like OBS Studio or like we use OBS Ninja or it could, I don't care, it could be Skype or Zoom or something like that. I was wondering if he was using something like that or if he was using the Restreams Live Studio, I believe it's called, or Studio Live. And he said he's tried both. He's tried both the Restream Live Studio and then uh, he's tried to use it with OBS, uh, bringing in different sources and he's one for one right now. I don't know what that one was, but it has been successful for him. It actually got me to look into Restream a little bit more. I use StreamYard on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. because it's free and I can go out to YouTube. Well, I've learned that I can use a free Restream account and go out to like Twitch and YouTube mm -hmm. and use Restream Live as the connection point like I've been using StreamYard Live. So I might actually try that. I might try the Restream.io free version for a week or two on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. just to see if it works. I think there are more free options in Restream than there are in StreamYard, but I don't know about the reliability. I don't know about the quality or anything like that. So I, I'm going to have to look into that. So I just want to say thank you, Jason, for bringing that up because it made me look more into it, it, it what the current uh, capabilities are, because I think Restream sh changed some of their stuff just in February or at least they started announcing it because some of the YouTube videos on it are in February from Restream, the Restream YouTube channel. And the last thing that we have here, which is something that we think that you should gather around and listen intently to if you are somebody that takes a Blue Yeti and puts it in the middle of a table in the bathroom. We, we think you should listen to the next piece of feedback that we have from Kim Alloway, because I think it's going to frame very nicely about the thing that you have been not considering when you shoved that blue Yeti in the middle of a table, in a bathroom, in an echo chamber. Go ahead, SP. Kim said, quote, the kids on Curious George this morning are testing out rooms in their school that are best to record reading. Teach them early. Unquote. Yeah, I love that. So it's not podcasting, it's no. recording reading, right? But it's the same concepts. It's like, okay, this room might be a little bit more echoey. This room might be a little bit more noisy. This room might be just right. You know, that sort of thing. So I, I, I love that. And I love that they're talking about technical stuff. And I know this didn't come about for podcasting. I'm just guessing it came out because a lot of kids are still doing distance learning and they're learning that different rooms have mm -hmm. different capabilities for them as to enhance or detract from their learning. So it, it's the same as podcasting. I love that they're learning this stuff now, though. I don't know why. Right now, a moment flashback to when my son was young. I can't remember the show that he watched. It, it wasn't a very high production or high budget production show, but... There was a moment, we were talking earlier in the show about podcast references and pop culture. I remember him actually mentioning, look, they're doing a podcast. And they had one where they, they did a podcast, the characters on there. And I totally forgot about that until right now, yeah. 
and it was a kid's show, and it was years ago. So uh, thanks for taking me through memory lane there, Kim Alloway. I totally forgot until right now. I haven't watched that. My kids are older, so I haven't watched any of that. Matter of fact, I just got a new grandkid, a puppy, on Saturday. So uh, I'm glad that I don't have kids anymore. <laughs> I mean, like young kids, because I'm just too old for that stuff. <laughs> so we would love to know what did you think about everything we talked about this week? And what other things do you like to follow in the world of hobby podcasting? Please get in touch with us through any of the ways. You can tweet us at BetterPod. You can find us at BetterPodcasting.com slash Discord. You can email podcast at BetterPodcasting.com. And you can create your own episode of Better Podcasting 250 using text-to-speech voices. <laughs> and then you can send it in to us, and <laughs> then we can choose whether or not we want to release it on our feed. <laughs> Uh, again, I want to thank, as I did at the beginning of the show, I want to thank our listeners. You guys are great. You guys are the reason that we're still doing this. You guys are the ones that are talking to us in our Discord or on Twitter. You're asking us questions. You're providing us resources. I really appreciate you. You have made this journey worth it, and you have made us feel needed and wanted, basically, and, and, and the stuff that we are doing is valuable for even new podcasters, which is what we wanted from the beginning. So we appreciate that. And if you ever have any feedback whatsoever on what we're doing or what we're not doing, please let us know and we will at least read it. And odds are we'll actually respond to you uh, probably on the podcast. We've done it before. Yes, thank you very much. I want to echo what SP said. I also want to just quickly acknowledge the Better Podcasting live chat. I know that we have Mentioned it in passing before and talked about it, but we would love if you could subscribe to that as well. As I mentioned earlier in the show, it is unedited largely, but we do that on the weeks that we're not doing this show so that we can cover more of these industry topics. And that's why I wanted to acknowledge it right here and right now today, because these topics that we cover, uh, what's happening in the industry, we will pick one or two for the better podcasting download. But on the live chat, we talk about a whole bunch more if they're a big news point that week. So we would love if you could subscribe to that as well and check it out and see what you think. It is a different show, but please check that out. And we also answer your your podcasting questions, either that you give to us in advance of the show, or if you come into our chat, we will answer your podcasting questions there too. I, I love that show. I love this show. I love all of my shows. Otherwise, I wouldn't do them. So for episode 250 of better podcasting i'm steven john drew saying i know what you were thinking last week why isn't steven the replaced voice <laughs> and i'm sp very thankful for my friend and co-host and co-producer steven we'll see everybody later bye bye thanks for checking out another episode of better podcasting you can find the full back catalog of Better Podcasting at betterpodcasting.com. If you're into geeky podcasts, please check out the other podcasts on the Gunna Geek Network at gunnageeknetwork.com. This show was produced and edited by Stephen John Drew of Gunna Geek Productions. Voice work was done by L.W. Salinas. Thanks again for listening or watching, and we hope to see you again next week. From music podcast to just wanting a notable intro, seemed like everyone wanted to play that song. <coughs> wow. <Whoa. laughs> wow. Don't know what that was. That was like almost borderline puberty. I, I don't know what that was. Wow. I, I, I've had my voice crack. I don't know that I've ever felt like like my whole voice was about to come out of my mouth like that. <laughs> no, it's like your throat decided to jump out of your body. <laughs>